Hi there, I'm Rosie D. along with Michael Forsyth, and you are listening to WQAT LP FM 99.5, the radio station of Allen Temple AME Church, the downtown church here in Greenville, South Carolina. Well, hello, Michael. How are you today? I am doing great. You're doing great? Wonderful. We've got a great show lined up today. Some um, very great people who are going to be on the show today. I look forward to hearing the interviews, and I'm sure everyone else there listening to. Today we're going to have Melanie Campbell. Melanie is the president of the National Coalition on Black Civic Participation. Uh, Melanie will speak with us today in a discussion along with the sisters-in-law, Davida and Janice Mathis. So we look forward to hearing her speak today. We also have Mark Allen Gunnels. I don't know if you all are familiar with him, but Mark is a Greer, South Carolina-based horror writer who has authored more than 20 books. And Mark's going to be our first guest, and then we'll have Melanie and the sisters. So we look forward to um, having all of our guests on the show today. And since it is October, we are focusing on words that pertain to the harvest season or whatever you call it, Halloween. Uh, So let's mention the word of today, and it's a doozy of a word, which is the word metathesiophobia. Metathesiophobia. Did I get that right? I think that's close enough. Yeah. All right. Metathesiophobia is a Greek word. And of course, we will talk about this word a little later in the segment. So you now have a little bit about today's show. So hang in with us because we truly appreciate your support. And again, I'm Rosie D along with Michael Forsyth. Please stay tuned for more music, commentary, and information here on WQATLP FM 99.5. We are the station of Allen Temple AME Church, the downtown church. Said we came from Jamaica, across the ocean, till we made it. And my DNA test at the west side of the motherland is where they take us from. Um, never remember daddy's side, so I couldn't tell y'all if I'm Zulu or Corsa. Couldn't tell y'all how I be courtside. I made it this far without a cosign. Of course, I struggled a lot and stay pray praying. Unforgettable. Swaley, swaley, demons, Achilles. Katie, Katie, now I'm up. It's a real life. And when it get real, I can feel Christ. Heal this branch on a family tree that was here for me. Man, it grew so deep. Self-discovery. Self-discover me. Help uncover me. Help me to understand who I'm supposed to be. Not just a wanna be. This is a dangerous area. 
Seen big pain, big loss, but still been big blessed. All that cap, big, 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 big stress. All y'all want big house, big car, big ice, big checks. And I wish y'all did, 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 did that less. You ain't gonna be nothing. No daddy was. You ain't gonna be nothing. I know that he always had um, something in yeah. him. My little cousin was hitting me up, man. I changed all my numbers. I never knew. Crazy how they just across the division, can't nobody get it the revenue. Seven numbers on a smartphone, equal cash app and lights on. I get royalties, but I got loyalty, so send the bill, I go half on. Half black, half unknown. Are we Cherokee or Seminole? I got PTSD running through me from a kinfolk. Stress had me going AWOL. Sin got me acting Adolf. I'm like, hey, y'all, I need days off. I'm depressed, having brain fog. Brain fog. Brain fog. It's obvious I'm highly blessed to finally get to understand what a man is when he had his godliest. To get there, I was highly stressed and I was highly stressed. Big pain, big loss, but still been big blessed. All that cap, big, 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 big stress. All y'all want big house, big car, big ice, big checks. Man, I wish y'all did, 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 did that. Less, 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 less,
And it's Razi D along with Michael Forsyth, and you are listening to WQAT FM 99.5. We are the radio station of Allen Temple AME Church, the downtown church in Greenville, South Carolina. Hey, did you know that the U.S. mail has slowed and the price of stamps has risen, Michael? I did not notice that. <laughs> yes, according to an article by NPR Daily, since Postmaster General Louis DeJoy recently enacted some cutbacks, Uh, that he states would save money. It's been proven, however, otherwise by experts who say that the cutbacks will put the Postal Service in a a death spiral. Mm. So does that mean that we're going to lose the post office? What does that mean? Well, I I think that um, conservatives have always, I don't know if always, but in in recent years have hated the post office. Mm. They hate that there is a public entity that mm-hmm. is providing a service. They feel almost every service is, should be privatized. So I think they've made multiple efforts to take out the post office. It has been spiraling down when you think about it. First it was the thing with the stamps. This is what I remember. Stamps were really cheap at one time and then they start rising, rising, rising. I'm like, okay, it's like 50 cents to mail a letter now, I think. I don't know because I haven't mailed a letter in so long, but um, I, I mean, I don't even, I, mean, I won't say that. I do use the postal service for some things if I'm shipping things, but as far as letters, I usually don't do that. I'll either email, text, or call, or do something like that. So I don't know, Michael. But how are you all out there feeling about this? So I don't know. Do you make want to hit us up on the church's webpage if you have, you know, your suggestions or comments about that question? We look forward to hearing from you if you would, you know, post those comments. All right, Michael, you got anything else to say before we come up on the 2 o'clock hour and we hear from Mark? I just can tell you that I am really looking uh, forward to uh, everyone hearing that this interview because he's a really talented uh, Mm -hmm. young man. And I think people will, who haven't heard anything about him in his work, will find it very interesting. Yes, and he's a, a Limestone alumni as that well. That is correct. Alumni. Our okay. own local Limestone College. Limestone. All right. Limestone in the house today. All right. So coming up in the 2 o'clock hour, you will hear from local horror writer Gunnels. Again, I am Rosie D, along with Michael Forsythe. Please stay tuned for more music, commentary, and information here on WQAT. 
that I kept on walking. Good grace of God Almighty, carry me. In the darkness and doubt, well, I kept on reaching. Yes, I did. Kept on reaching. Oh, yeah. Kept on reaching. I pushed up that mountain and I kept on reaching. Oh, but the good grace of God Almighty, carry me. In the worry and woe, you know I kept on singing. I just kept, kept on, on singing. That bone kept on singing. That word you say so well. Kept on singing. Good grace of God Almighty carried me in the darkest night. I saw a vision in the holy light on the longest day. I kept on walking.
specialize in. And think it possible. He loves to move. When all hope is lost. Just so he can show up. Today in African American History, October 10th, 1966, the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense was founded in Oakland, California by college students Huey Newton and Bobby Seale. Inspired by the writings of Mao Zedong, Che Guevara, and other revolutionaries, the founders viewed the black community as a colony exploited by white businessmen, the government, and the police. The liberation of oppressed people depended 
upon their gaining control of their own communities. The founding document of the Black Panther Party, known as the Ten Point Program, addressed the major issues facing urban black communities with demands for full employment and adequate housing. It read, We want land, bread, housing, education, clothing, justice, and peace. The Panthers adopted two main programs. First, they organized armed patrols that followed the police around the black community. On these patrols, they wore leather jackets and berets as uniforms to signify the military discipline of the Panthers, as well as a new black power identity. The Panthers also set up free breakfast programs, medical clinics, after schools, and other community programs. By 1970, the BPP had over 30 national chapters in major cities. Their growing national prominence drew the attention of FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover, who launched a counterintelligence program, officially known as COINTELPRO, to neutralize the Black Panthers. It was largely successful. This information comes from the website Black Facts. Hi there, I'm Rosie D, and you're listening to WQAT LP FM 99.5. We are the radio station of Allen Temple AME Church, the downtown church here in Greenville, South Carolina. Today, our first guest is Mark Allen Gunnels. Mark is a Greer, South Carolina based horror writer who has authored more than 20 books. This is Mike Forsyth on WQAT, the radio station of Allen Temple AME, the downtown church in Greenville, South Carolina. It's Halloween season, and this month we're celebrating some of the creators who delight us with stories about things that go bump in the night. I'm honored to have with me today Mark Allen Gunnels, one of the treasures of the upstate. Mark is a masterful horror writer, the author of more than 20 novels and short story collections, including 2B, The Quarry, and Deviations from the Norm. Mark, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me on. It was was an honor to get to talk to you. (laughs) Well, there's so many different genres of fiction. There's thrillers, there's romance. Um, what drew you to the horror genre? You know, um, I almost feel like it just found me. Um, one of my earliest memories is watching with my family the original Salem's Lot miniseries when it aired. Uh, which means I would have been about five years old. Um, but I do have some very vivid memories of watching that with them. And um, I think what drew me to horror was the fact that it really made an impact. Like, you know, I didn't have a lot of limits on what I could watch growing up. I had a very permissive household that way. But a lot of things I watched just sort of came and went in my mind. But, like, the horror stuff, like, it made an impact, and that's why I can still remember at five years old watching that miniseries. So I think it was the fact that I realized, like, you could tell a story that would just grab a reader and just stick with them. And um, and I just became kind of hooked on horror. And, I re- like, growing up, that was my go-to. I wanted to see horror movies and horror shows. And, you know, it's a, it's a love I've carried into my adulthood. Now, would you say that growing up in a permissive household also helped to foster your imagination in general? Um, it probably did because I was, at a young age, just allowed to be exposed to all different types of stories, um, all this different genres, and, and therefore the idea of story just seemed kind of limitless because I saw all these different things. And I also think, you know, I grew up um, in a family without much money. I grew up um, kind of the quintessential high school geek and didn't have many friends. And all those things sort of worked together. Um, 
and so I sort of lived in my imagination a lot. And when I think back about all the like games I made up to play by myself in the backyard when I was a kid, I can see how that was really just a precursor to me sitting down and just, you know, playing make believe on the page. Yes. So when you were a child, you, you start to write little short stories. What, what were they like? What were those about? Um, I sometimes call them Twilight Zone knockoffs because <laughs> I was really into the Twilight Zone when I was a kid, both the original uh, Rod Serling Twilight Zone and also when I was uh, a kid, there was the 80s incarnation. And um, that really helped informed, inform my idea of horror, and a lot of my horror to this day I still consider kind of Twilight Zone influenced, but those little, it was like little one-page stories I was writing probably when I was about 10, and I mean, they were, I don't still have any of them, but the one I remember was called Horror or Laura, <laughs> about a, a cheerleader who finds out she had a mentally deranged twin that had been locked in the attic all her life, and she broke out and tried to kill her popular sister. Um... Not, you know, great literature, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, it, I was just doing those little kinds of things um, because, you know, they, they tickled me and it reminded me of the stories that I liked. Yes. Well, you know, your books are very visual, very well paced, and I, I can feel the influence of films. Are, are there specific ones which you enjoy that you feel influenced your writing? Um, I, I will say that I fell in love with movies before I fell in love with books. Now, once I got older and I fell in love with books, that totally eclipsed. I still love movies, but, you know, books are where it's at for me. But, you know, I did initially get drawn to stories and horror through movies. So I think that does have an effect. And because I came of age in the, um, the 80s, you know, slashers were really big. I can remember going to the local theater and seeing all the new Friday the 13th and Halloween and Nightmare on Elm Street movies. And I do think, you know, that actually has an impact on my writing, too. I, I Sometimes there are certain books of mine where I can look at it and see I'm pouring my love of the 80s horror movies I grew up on into, into certain stories. Yes. Well, in terms of writers, Stephen King, of course, has been an influence on every horror writer alive, I would say. Um, but Clive Barker has a special role in, in your uh, career in, in terms of influence. You Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah. Um, when I discovered Clive Barker, I was a, a little bit older in my teens. Um, and at first, I was just drawn to him because his horror fiction was very visceral and it was very original. It was like stuff I had never really seen in a story before. Um, and so I was already a fan and already sort of an awe on him, awe of him for that. But um, also in the, God, I guess it was the mid nineties was when um, he publicly came out as a, uh, as a gay man. And I was a gay man, but I wasn't really, writing fiction with gay characters because I didn't, I looked around at the horror scene and I thought, well, you just can't do that and hope to have a readership. But um, his public coming out and um, some of the books he wrote after that really like gave me the confidence to just tell my own stories, include gay characters, and made me realize, you know, there there is a place for me in the horror genre and I don't have to compromise who I am to be a part of it. So I'll always have a very deep love of uh, Clive Barker for that. Yeah, well, he's he's terrific. He's um, he's got this this darkness <laughs> in his writing um, that just uh, really uh, gets me. Um, well, can you tell listeners what is your latest book and, and a little bit about what it's about? Uh, the most recent book I have out is a novel called Before He Wakes which is a suspense thriller from uh, Crystal Lake Publishing. And um, the idea is that there is this, this deranged man who has kidnapped two young people, and he is holding them hostage in his basement, which he has sort of transformed into sort of a prison. 
and he goes out to get supplies and ends up getting into a horrible, tragic accident, which leaves these two young people trapped. No one knows where they are. They don't have any food or water. And so the majority of the story is them trying to find a way to get out of the situation they are in. Uh, yeah, that sounds, that's creeping me out already, just hearing about it. Well, what would you say is uh, the most critical elements in crafting a powerful horror story? Well, I think one of the most important things is initially grounding it in a reality that people can relate to and recognize. Um, Because that makes it a little easier for them to suspend their disbelief when the more outrageous elements start coming into it. Um, If they feel like the world is real, they'll more readily accept the more otherworldly elements. Um, And a great way to do that is with character, creating characters that feel very authentic, uh, like people you might know, and that's sort of the reader's way into the story. So... I definitely think, you know, a good grounding and good characters is a good starting point to build the horror from. That that totally makes sense. When I think about horror stories and horror movies that I've seen, um, the most uh, successful ones for myself are ones where you actually care what happens to the characters. They're not just getting slashed off one by one, which brings me to this. You you did a TED Talk recently with an interesting title, What Horror Taught Me About Empathy. Now, to many people, those two terms don't go together. Can you explain the connection? Yeah, and the whole reason I wanted to do that talk was because there had been a big article um, in the New Republic where the author had suggested that people who love horror films are less empathetic than other people, and my experience has been the exact opposite. Um, To me, the whole driving force of horror hinges on empathy. Um, That's what creates the horror, is you see these people in these situations, you feel for them, you put yourself in their shoes, and that's what builds that sense of horror. If you don't have that, you might have some kind of film, but it's not true horror to me because you're not feeling that primal emotion of horror. So to me, horror is built on getting an empathetic response out of its audience. So to me, growing up, watching a lot of horror, I think it actually helped me develop a greater sense of empathy, because I was constantly putting myself in these character shoes and feeling for them. And so I think people, when they think about horror, especially people who aren't really fans of the genre, they have an idea about horror fans that maybe isn't true. So I wanted to sort of have the opportunity to give this talk and give them a different perspective on it. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, Yeah, people, you can find that TED Talk. um, You just Google it. Um, you know, uh, one of the books that uh, of yours that I read that I, I really enjoyed was The Quarry. And it, in terms of a realistic setting, you certainly uh, pulled that off because it takes place, ladies and gentlemen, at our own nearby Limestone College. Um, can you tell us, uh, tell the listeners uh, b- briefly what that story is about? Uh, well, uh, the story is about... Um It is set at Limestone, which is my alma mater. Um, And anyone who might know Limestone knows there's a lake on the campus um, that was once a limestone quarry uh, that filled in and became sort of a natural lake. And the premise of the novel is that there is some otherworldly creature who is trapped under the waters of the quarry and is trying to influence Um, a few students on campus to try to free himself. Um, So it's a part creature feature, has a little bit of a possession possession tale in it. Uh, At times there are even flasher elements to it. So that one is one where I really was just combining a lot of the different elements I love about horror and then getting to add in my love of of limestone, (laughs) um, which sounds weird. I, I show the college how much I love it by setting a story there where horrible things are happening, but, 
But yeah, so that that one does hold a, a special because it was yeah. the first major thing I ever wrote set at limestone. Yes. Um, can you explain sort of what is your creative process? Do you work with an outline? Uh, how, how does it work for you? I'm not much of an outliner. Um, I have outlined actually the, the one I mentioned earlier that just came out before he wakes. I did outline that one just because that novel really, it was a series of obstacles the characters are going to have to overcome. And I didn't want to get myself in a situation where I got to a point and I didn't know how they were going to overcome the next obstacle. So I did an outline for that one just so I knew going in, I knew what they were going to do for each problem they faced. But um, typically I start with just a premise and some characters. And then I just start from there. I might have a vague idea of where I think I'm going, but that doesn't always turn out to be where. I end up going, but um, I just start and I really work on developing the characters because I feel once I have the characters firmly developed, they sort of dictate where the story goes from there. Their personalities tell me how they would react in the situations I put them in, and then they help guide the story from there. Yeah. Well, I got to say, when I look at the uh, quantity of, of and quality of work you've put out in the last 12 years and we're, we're Facebook friends and I'll see like how many pay how many word your word count for the day sometimes you'll you'll let us know about and I'm, I'm just so impressed so many writers uh, talk about writers block um, how are you able to be so prolific um, I think one of the keys to my um, writing is that I always want to have fun. I mean, that doesn't mean there are not days where, you know, it's, it's hard and I'm frustrated and I don't really want to do it. But for the most part, I always approach it with a sense of joy and excitement. And like I said, you know, going back to when I was a kid, like I'm just playing make-believe. Like I never had to stop doing that the way some adults do. So that keeps me really energized to do it. And I, but you also, I mean, you have to make time for it because there's a million different things drawing our attention this way and that. And it's easy to think you have writer's block just because you decide you're going to do other things and not really make time for it. So mm. I, you know, my thing is I get up and everyone works different, differently. But for me, I like to get up first thing in the morning and write. That way, no matter what else the day brings, I've accomplished that. So, and I've been doing that for, for a little while. Um, and, you know, it, it, and it just adds up. Like, because sometimes I feel like I don't really write that much per day. But if you're consistently writing every day, even that little bit is going to pile up until you have a whole novel written. So it's just keeping it fun, but also with that discipline of, I'm going to make time for this every day. And when you keep it really fun, you want to make that time for it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as you mentioned, you're a gay man, and you've uh, incorporated now gay characters into your books. Um, and you've been a, a champion, really pretty vocal, about diversity in um, the genre. Now, some people might say, well, hey, I don't care if the guy's gay or not. I just want to read a book. I don't care what anybody is. Um, why should people make an effort to seek out uh, diversity among the writers that they read? Well, historically, in certain genres, and horror is one of them, writers from minority groups and marginalized groups haven't had really the opportunities to flourish. So... I get it when people say, I just want a good story. I just want a good story, too. I just recognize that if you just pull from whatever is most visible to you, it's going to not necessarily be that diverse, just because historically, you know, straight white men have kind of had the feel to themselves. And that's not saying they're not writing some great stuff. They are. But they're not the only ones. And the others sometimes have to be sought out more because they're not I mean, in a perfect world, if you just 
picked a random book off the shelf because it looked interesting, there would be an equal chance that it might be from a diverse writer. But we don't live in that world quite yet. And I think the way we get there is to seek out more diverse writers, thus raising their profile and getting them more attention. And then we will have a more level playing field. But I also find that when I seek out writers from different cultures or different races or different sexual orientations or gender identities, I'm getting fresh takes on horror because our personal experiences sometimes dictate the stories we tell and the more different writers I read, they, I mean, they can, you know, you can get an idea that is basically familiar, but get a completely fresh twist on it if it's someone from another you know, country who's writing it because they might not see the world exactly the way an American would or, you know, just things like that. So I, I do think, one, it's important just to make the playing field more level and two, just for the reader, him or herself, it's going to give you an even more exciting reading experience. Yeah, you make a very good case. Well, speaking of diversity, um, within the genre of horror, there are subgenres. There's slasher, paranormal, um, monsters. Um, is there a particular uh, aspect that you feel yourself most drawn to? Oh, my interests really do run the gamut. Um, so I like almost every subgenre of horror. If I had to pick a favorite, I might say the ghost story or the haunted house. Um, there's just something about that. And I do like horror sometimes that is a little more um, subtle and atmospheric and builds gradually. And a lot of like ghost stories and haunted house novels sort of have that atmosphere I like. But, um, but you know, I love it all. But if I had to pick one, I, I am a particular fan of the the haunted house, John. And now a related question. This is Halloween season. Uh, I must ask you, what scares you? What scares me? Um, I think that what really scares me is a lack of control. Um, and that also, you know, maybe that's one of the reasons I like haunted house story so much it's like you are in your own environment but you've somehow lost control of it um but you know that a lot of horror really deals with that no matter what the subgenre of it is it's that you know there are things happening that you can't stop and you just have to try to react to them and do the best you can but it i do think it's that that loss of control that feeling of this is just happening to me and there's little I can do to it. Um, that kind of thing really, really creeps me out. Yeah. Well, um, I believe um, if my last glance at your Facebook page was, is, is accurate, the book you're working on is, is Lucid. Can you give readers, uh, listeners a little, some kind of little foretaste of what that might be about? Uh, Lucid is, is kind of a, um, it's a surreal novel that mostly takes place in dreams. Uh, the premise is there is a man who is a lucid dreamer, meaning that he knows he's dreaming while he's dreaming and therefore can sort of control what happens. Um, but he ends up in a coma where he gets stuck in this dream world, which at first seems like it it wouldn't be so bad, but then he actually starts to lose control over what's happening in the dream. But because he's in a coma, he can't just wake himself up. He's trapped in there with the elements that have gone out of control and is just trying to, you know, survive them long enough for him to actually wake up. Oh, Mark, Mark, Mark. This is this is up my alley. I, I'm a big uh, lucid dreamer. Um, I, I had one just last week. I, I was suddenly in my parents' house, and, you know, we're talking, and then I realized, wait a minute, they're both deceased. That must mean either I'm dead or I'm dreaming, and, you know, that's 
couple minutes later, I'm flying. So, oh, wow. I, I really want to read that one. Well, um, Mark, where can people find out more about you and, and find your books? Uh, well, I have an author page on Amazon, Mark Allen Gunnels. All my, my stuff that's in print is there. Um, I'm very active on social media, on Facebook, on Twitter, at Mark A. Gunnels. Uh, I do have an Instagram, Make Reading Cool Again, but where I just post pictures of books. Um, and I, I have a blog, markgunnels.livejournal.com, that I update semi-regularly. Great. Well, um, I hope that someday soon, again, you know, a uh, few Halloweens ago, you and I did a reading of scary stories at the uh, Coffee Underground on Halloween. <laughs> Remember that? Yeah, it was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. Well, readers, please check out the works of uh, Mark Allen Gunnels, the author of Before He Wakes, To Be, and many other novels. Thank you so much for joining us, Mark. It was my pleasure. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to our interview with Mark Allen Gunnels. This is Mike Forsyth on WQAT, the radio station of Allen Temple AME, the downtown church in Greenville, South Carolina. You have just listened to Mark Allen Gunnels, a horror writer based in Greer, South Carolina. For more information about Mark Allen Gunnels and his books, you can purchase them on Amazon.com. Again, I'm Rozzy D. Please stay tuned because there is much more on the way here on WQAT. I just want to make it in oh, oh. I just want to cross that river my Lord, my Lord. I want to be free from sin oh, oh. I just want my name written Oh Lord Written in the Lamb's book of life yeah, yeah, yeah. And when this life is over woo, Just want to have eternal life, Lord oh, I want to hear you say
again, it's Rosie D along with Michael Forsyth, and you're listening to WQAT LP FM 99.5. We are the radio station of Allen Temple AME Church, the downtown church here in Greenville, South Carolina. Well, we have just listened to Mark Allen Gunnels, our local horror story writer from Greer, South Carolina. And Mark, we want to thank you so much for being on our show. We truly appreciate you in granting us the interview, and we wish you the continued success in your writing endeavors. Now let's kind of circle back to the word of the day, which is the doozy word, metathesiophobia. <laughs> and I hope I said that right. But that word is spelled M-E-T-A-T-A-G-S-I-O-P-H-O-B-I-A. It's a phobia, metathesiophobia. Oh, phobia. My, Michael, say that for me. You you say it. You, you choose these words so I know you know how to say that. I would have to say it's metathesiophobia. Metathesiophobia. I have to speed yeah, it up. That on sounds the, good. There you yeah, go. That metathesiophobia. Good. Say, it, say it fast seven times. <laughs> <laughs> Someone suffering from metathesiophobia may not be able to handle even the most minuscule changes. So, for example, something as small as having to go to a new grocery store due to the old one closing down, like the Bilo store closed down. Now you got to go to Food Lion. Um, that closing down may make them anxious or metathesiophobic. Yes, yes. All right. So that's what it means. It means a fear of whatever's going on there. Fear of change. Fear of change. There you go. Our guest, uh, Mark Allen Gunnels, who writes horror stories about monsters and things that aren't real, but fear of change is something almost all of us face in real life. Are you good at handling change? That's the question. Uh, when have you had anxious thoughts about things changing and how do you cope with it? When we look at how society is changing around us, this upsets people, especially the older generation. Are some people politically conservative because they suffer from a certain amount of this metathesiophobia? What do you say about this, Michael? Well, let's have a discussion about this. Yes. Um, yeah, I think starting with that last point, mm -hmm. um, I think that there's a lot of anxiety in the uh, dominant community, shall we say, the, you know, the, the white uh, affluent community. There is a fear that as society changes and demographics change, that they will lose power and position and so you see them lashing back mm. against any change like you know the um when it was announced that in i guess the disney ver update of space jam pepe Le Pew, the skunk would mm. not be there you know people were like in a, in a panic you know my god how can they Meanwhile, no one really cared about Pepe Le Pew, but just the fact that this change was taking place and that it indicated that um, power was going into the hands of others, um, I think that's a, a real, that, that, that explains a lot of what they do, especially when it's about petty, seemingly mm -hmm. petty matters. Absolutely. Even with the, um, what's the show, with The Princess and the Frog, and they had Tiana in there, you know, different kind of character. She was... African American. Yes. Um, you know, people were like, oh, I'm not going to see that because, you know, come on, guys. It's, she's not even real, you know. <laughs> Anybody can play uh, a fictitious character, but, you know, I guess yes. some people fear changes and that it's going to change whatever narrative they're thinking about there, but, you know, it happens. And since we are talking about phobia, Mike, phobias, <clears throat> excuse me, there are tons of phobias. You know that, right? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Long list. There is a long list. You know, I, I have some of these phobias, especially <laughs> the arachnophobia. I don't like spiders. So that's what an arachnophobic is. You have a fear of spiders. And then a lot of people have the fear of snakes, which is the ophidiophobia. How do you say that? Ophidiophobia. O-P-H-I-D-I-O-phobia. And then you have acrophobia, which is the fear of heights. That's one of mine, too. I, I don't like heights. And sometimes I don't like crowds, especially since mm. COVID is going on, which is the agoraphobic. And that's people who fear often and they won't leave their home. I, I do leave my house, but I just don't like crowds at the moment because of COVID, you know. Mm, yeah. But there's like tons of phobias out there. I mean, if you want to um, check out some of the phobias, you can go to fearof.net and take a look at the list of all those phobias that are out there. 
What else, Michael, you got going on over there? Well, you know, I would say in terms of phobias, um, I guess the one that is closest to that with me would be fear of heights. Mm. I really don't like them. And, you know, some people say the fear of heights is really rooted in the fear that you will impulsively throw yourself off of something. Oh, my God. Yeah, I, I, and I, I guess I kind of feel that feeling. You know, if I'm on a bridge, right? I know the bridge is not going to collapse. Exactly. And the only way that I can fall over the bridge... Is if I stumble or if, something. Or if I threw myself over. And it's right. like, well, what if I had the impulse to do it? Well, if somebody pushed me. I have that fear of heights, too, when... I, I go somewhere really high up. I'm like, oh, my God, I, I can't even move. I just get paralyzed. I, I don't like tall buildings. When I fly on the plane, I don't even look out the window. I'm like, okay, let me just get to where I'm going and get it over with. But <laughs> I don't like heights. I, that, that's one of my fears. And when we go up in the mountains, and uh, we used to go a lot and stand on the air. Oh, I can't do that. I can't. I can't. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. Um, phobias are something else. And they are real in the minds of the, of the person who is experiencing that phobia. So... I don't know. But, you know, uh, as I was looking at that list, at l the first dozen of them mm -hmm. are of things which actually could very seriously harm you, like a snake. Right. Or a certain spiders or, you know, clips. Or the fear of holes, tripho tripophobia, tripophobia. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I when you think of fear of holes... Mm -hmm. um, you think of, well, like a manhole, of course, you'd be afraid you might fall right. in it. But I think these people, they if they see a, a hole piece like of, on a flower or something, rind, oh, or a piece of paper, if you punched holes in it, it would freak them out. Wow. And the aerophobia, that's me, the fear of flying. I'll fly, but I'm like, okay, I have to really psych myself out. How about the fear of death, which is thanatophobia? T H A N A T O P H O B I A? Yeah. Um, that's the fear of death. Even talking about death can be hard when you have this phobia. Yeah, that's an, it's an interesting thing because obviously uh, the fear of death is the, the most rational, but I guess mm -hmm. it's just this thing where you're really sort of obsessing about it. And, right. And, you know, if you really think about it, if, if we really had our heads on straight, mm -hmm. death would be the almost the only thing we'd be uh, worrying about. Right. But I think maybe those of us who kind of put that concern about it dying you know, we kind of s sublimate that. Right, right. You know, we're, maybe we're the ones that are a little quick, kooky, you know. <laughs> but you shouldn't fear death, though. It's going to happen, and you won't even know when you're dead, so. Well, that's true. You won't know. Now, there's another one, interesting one, glossophobia. I'm sure all college students have this because when you take that public speaking class and you got to stand up there and do those speeches, oh, boy. But um, obviously, I don't have a fear of uh, <laughs> public speaking phobia <laughs> I saw on the radio here. Uh, yeah. And then there's another one called, what is this one? Monophobia, which is the fear of being alone, mm. even while eating or sleeping. I don't have that one either. I don't fear being alone. But you know, um, my daughters are experiencing that right mm. now. You know, really? they're, they're identical twins. Mm -hmm. And for the first time, they've gone away to college, diff separate colleges. Oh my, how's and that going? Being alone. It's going well, but it's taken some adjustment. Because, yeah. you know, that thing of the, a degree of solitude is such a, um, a fundamental part of the human experience. And yet they've been spared it because right. they've always had a companion. And exactly. now they're experiencing that. I guess they'll have to grow out of that, right? I guess they will, or yeah, will they ever? Well, I, I think uh, that connection and those issues can never completely be erased. But mm -hmm. I think, you know, you start to form other types of bonds with other people. Wow, 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 wow. Now, there is a phobia out there that has about 30 letters in it. I can't even <laughs> say this one, but it's the fear of long words. Believe it or not, it's real. That's, that's, that's you don't want to try and say it? You don't take a crack and say it? Oh, that? God. Hippopotamana, stratamus, quack, quack, blah, blah. <laughs> that's just ridiculous. <laughs> it's a long word. It's about 30 letters, and it's the fear of long words. And then, of course, the xenophobic or the xenophobe, the fear of the unknown. How about the fear of driving, Michael? I had that bad. Via phobia? I had that really bad. Really? Um, yeah. You know, I got my license uh, when I was 18. Mm -hmm. And I lived in Manhattan where you don't really need to drive. Right. Um, so, but part of it, as I got older, it wasn't just didn't need to. But I really was um, alarmed at the thought of having to drive. And I think, it, once again, it comes back to that thing of, 
well, what if you did something wrong? What if you ran someone over? Mm. You know, or how horrible that would be. You know what? I, I, I often find that most people from New York, they do have a, a problem with driving. I have a, a friend down in Spartanburg, and she's from New York. And she doesn't like to drive on the highway. She said, for what? I can't see. You know, it's dark. I'm like, okay, you may need to go get your eyes checked. But they just have trouble. They have trouble driving on the highway. I'm like, okay. And, it, and it's, I would say it's so dark. I guess because in New York, it's just so bright all the time, the lights and everything. But she has a problem with driving on, on the highway, and especially at night. So I don't know. Maybe it's a New York thing. <laughs> <laughs> Here's one final one here. This is the panophobia, the fear of everything, or fear that terrible things will happen. I, I've heard of this one before. So um, there you have it. There's like tons of phobias out there. I didn't realize it was that many of them out here, Michael, but there's lots of them, at least a hundred or so on this website. If you go out there and, and check it out, it is fearof.net. All right, Michael. So um, coming up in the three o'clock hour, we're going to hear from Melanie Campbell. She'll be interviewing uh, with the sisters-in-law, Davida and Janice Mathis. So Again, I'm Rosie D along with Michael Forsyth. Please stay tuned for more music and commentary here on WQAT. You are my strength. I've been doing some thinking lately, and I know and believe that God still works miracles, yet I'm so very, very grateful for what some call the simple things. I just want to take a moment here. This is my prayer. Listen. I acknowledge that you're in control. There's nothing too hard for you to handle. I believe you can do anything your word says so. No limits even come close to your dominion. Son 
Today's Bible reading is from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under the sun, a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to cast away, a time to tear, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, A time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. Hi there, I'm Rozzy D, and you're listening to WQAT LPFM 99.5. We are the radio station of Allen Temple AME Church, the downtown church here in Greenville, South Carolina. Our second guest today is Melanie Campbell. Melanie is the president of the National Coalition on Black Civic Participation. Melanie was interviewed by sisters-in-law Davida and Janice Mathis, and Melanie will talk about how her organization is fighting for voter rights and other issues concerning people of color and women. Welcome to Sisters-in-Law, real sisters, real lawyers, really good talk. We are Janice and Davida Mathis, the Sisters-in-Law, and we're happy that you joined us today. Our special guest will be our dear sister, Melanie Campbell, the President and CEO of the National Coalition on Black Civic Participation and the convener of the Black Women's Roundtable. She is the person that called together the protests at the Congress and at the Supreme Court and is fighting a season of action, a summer of action, and I think it's going to turn into uh, a whole uh, lifetime of action for civil rights, voting rights, and women's rights. In 2000, she was recognized as one of Washington, D.C.'s top 40, under 40 emerging leaders. She created an innovative youth-focused leadership development program, Black Youth Vote. She served as a lead trainer for the West African Women's Colloquium in Ghana, West Africa. She has worked on several political campaigns, including Bill Clinton for president, Jesse Jackson for president, and Andrew Young for mayor. She was a leading force for urging President Biden to select a black woman as his running mate as vice president. Please join me in welcoming Melanie Campbell. We know that voting rights have been under attack this entire season. The Supreme Court refused to stop the state of Arizona from discriminating against voters and limiting their right to vote. And now we see that it's spreading all across the nation. Hundreds of bills, including in our home state of Georgia, not much in South Carolina yet, but they're soon to follow. Today we have an expert with us, and we want to just ask you, Melanie, What do you see in this season of voting rights, and why did you decide to take a contingent of women to the Supreme Court yesterday to speak out? First, thanks for partnering yesterday and and enduring the heat. And um, but we uh, we we just the the main reason uh, that uh, we continue to 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 elevate the issue. You know, with um, from, from the from the streets, if you will, right? is because we have been struggling to get our voting rights protected, right? In the in in 
the House and then also the Senate. And most importantly, the Senate has been the problem of not being able to get folks to step up and get the vote, figure out how to pass voting rights protections when we're at, you know, um, uh, the worst modern day attack on voting rights we've seen, uh, in a, in a very long time. So, but also there are other kinds of issues that are, uh, of, of our constitutional rights that are under attack as well. And that's women's, um, right to choose, um, uh, dealing with reproductive rights. And so we, uh, as you know, we decided to show up at the Supreme Court because just as a backdrop to understand that the Supreme Court has not protected our voting rights, nor are they protecting our women, women's rights with a lot of, um, really unconstitutional laws that are being passed. And so we, we showed up there, uh, with the, with the Supreme Court in the background and we're looking at the very building and the very, uh, uh, politician, uh, who was supposed to be public servant, uh, have the power in their hand to actually correct the problem that we didn't, uh, we're not getting from the Supreme Court. So that's the, the short answer of it. And so many women, uh, organizations who were fighting on the issue of reproductive justice and reproductive rights had wanted to do more and be more vocal about voting rights. And so we have been planning to do something um, around that, but then Texas, had, who has passed some, some draconian voter suppression law, just also passed a law um, in Texas to make it uh, pretty much almost impossible for a woman to uh, practice her constitutional right to an abortion, and um, and so the um, we ended up expanding and then uh, connecting the dots. Because really people, voting rights is, is really something that is not just a black issue, although black people, uh, in our, in this country, we've always had to, to, uh, depend on voter, uh, voter, our voting rights being protected through the, our Voting Rights Act of 65. The actual, the other part of it is we have this issue. So we said we need to come together, bring these movements together because you, you can't get the voter and you, and you were very eloquent yesterday when you talked about it. You can't get anything that we really care about. It starts with the ability to, with the vote when you're talking to public policy. And so if you don't have the ability to elect candidates of choice, run for office so you can be, you know, be that elected official yourself, what are we talking about here? So the, the, that reality is that everything is tied to it. You can't deal with health care. You can't deal with so many other issues, you know, the issues around police reform, the things that our people took our lives in our hand last year to vote for. Uh, racial, uh, dealing with issues of racial injustice in this country. All these things, COVID, that's still running rapid. You got elected officials doing crazy things in many of these states, uh, not doing their jobs and being public servants, but being political hacks. So there's so much going on, but at the core of it, not it's the only solution, but it is for this, this, um, uh, country, this nation, the reality is the vote is, is that, that, that power, that vote is what we can use to push back policies to help either hurt you or help you, right? And so we're at a crossroads in this country that it may not, uh, it, that uh, at the end of the day, we may it may not be the democracy that our children's children or even our grandchildren and mm-hmm. nieces and nephews from me, right, will be able to recognize as a democracy that's good for them. You know, what was so impressive to me about yesterday's gathering at the court was the array of different kinds of women's organizations. And you got that thing together in like, seemed like to me, 24 hours, <laughs> including t-shirts, which I have on now. Talk a little bit about the coalition that you gathered and what kind of relationships you had to call on to me. You had Jewish women, you had white women, you had Asian Pacific. Talk a little bit about bringing that coalition together and why that's significant. Well, you know, we, we, we set up back in July, you know, with National Council of Negro Women and us coming together around the idea that we knew from voting rights that we needed, it was, that if the impact was, was, is broader than black. So we said black women are leading. Yes, we're stepping out here, but we need an ally. So we've been working, uh, on that, uh, uh, since July as far as expanding, uh, some of the coalitions that from, from, you know, from, from where I'm sitting at the coalition, national coalition, 
and Black Women's Roundtable to really kind of build a, a set of allies. Some folks we already work with. Others uh, that we brought on uh, to uh, 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 to stand in solidarity with are uh, relationships of relationships, right? Relationships matter, right? So it's really, uh, so some of the partner organizations that we work with, like National Women's Law Center, we work, um, and, and these movements, you know, kind of cross-pollinate, right, at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. So we're working a lot with a lot of some of the organizations around um, a paid family leave for all. Uh, you have, uh, and so and so those folks uh, are, were some of those women's organizations that are part of that coalition were there. Um, and um, you had the ERA coalition. Yeah, it, it, thank you. ERA yeah, the coalition. National Organization yeah. for Women had Ellie Smith like a real I mean Ellie. Yeah, goes, and Ellie goes, goes way back. back. Yeah. Ellie forty years ago. Yeah, goes back and, and from the feminist majority, and right. it was just you don't know, often see. Now they'll put us out front. You know, we'll be at the point of the spear, driving the protest, driving the, but a lot of times they'll sort of hang back. And y'all do that hard work about voting rights and we're going to be with our issue. Yeah. But yesterday was different because it was everybody sort of, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it seemed like everybody was getting the point that without voting rights, you don't have any rights. That's what we, that's the, what I felt good about. Now we got to build on it, of course, uh, yeah. as, as this thing escalates, but I felt good that we got you know, some folks who you're right, who really at the end of the day were hanging back because when we talk about the filibuster, right? Not to get into the sausage making, but the 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 the, the reality that there's rules uh, of uh, engagement in the U.S. Senate on how you pass a bill. Most average person thinks it just takes 50 plus one, but not in the United States Senate. They got this 60. You got to have 60 votes to pass legislation, or most legislation. So that that rule is archaic and has a racist past, as we all know, many of us know, um, that they know that, and I'm talking about they as in the women's groups like that, like feminist majority and others, that if we don't deal with these voting rights, how in the world do you think you're going to come back and deal with something as, 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 ch- as challenging uh, as reproductive rights? And so these, these, these we talk about... Um, the intersectionality, right, mm-hmm. uh, 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 of uh, issues, and so the issues around race and gender um, are really in a, in, intertwined. And so, you know, if they come for me today, they come up for you tomorrow, right? You know what? And that's the truth. And guess what? They came for me yesterday. They came for you today. When it right. comes to so the idea of trying to figure out a, the way to message that was the what you're displaying, voting rights equal reproductive justice equals re- equals reproductive rights. You could say voting rights equals health care. You could say voting rights equal uh, pay, uh, pay family. There's no way if you're trying to move a quote unquote progressive agenda, um, it, 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 especially in this very polarized times. That and then it's going to be we're going to need to we got to change the rules. I think we're going to have to change the rules. Yes, I don't. I, I'm trying to be as optimistic about the idea that the Democrats, and I'm not being partisan, just factual, are going to get 10 Republicans to vote the right way. In these modern day times, where it's so, uh, we're so divided, where historically voting rights was a bipartisan issue. You just, yeah. it, 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 right? And, and no more. And, um, I think, every, honestly to me, it didn't start with Trump. He just took it to another level. It started after the first black man was elected. It just did. And you yep. trace it back to 2000, uh, to 2009, to, um, when he get it, 2008, and what happened by 2010. And you started seeing all of those, uh, when the, uh, laws being passed in your home state of uh, South Carolina and my home state of Florida and other states, especially the South, right? Uh, where you, people are holding on to some relic of the past that nobody's going back to. Um, that our parents and, and grandparents and foreparents fought hard for. Nobody going back to that time where, uh, or, or or a new version of of, of apartheid, political apartheid in this country that one party rules. Mm-hmm. Uh, we will fight, and we, we're gonna keep fighting until we win. We don't have a choice in the matter. The other element that was significant yesterday, there were a lot of young women, and I know you work with Black Youth Vote. And you got young folk all over the country that you are in collaboration with and convene at a meeting. 
after the rally to do some planning for the future. Talk about what it takes to motor. You know, they said the young folks don't want to do this, don't want to do that. But they were out there in force yesterday. Yeah, and several organizations sent some of their young leaders. Yeah, um, NAACP. Right, and they're actually, you know, um, um, the NAACP, you know, had a, a, a case with it out there and others. Um, but it, it's like, I, and I feel it's not too different from us. You know, <laughs> give your opportunity at the table. Just know you at the table. Dr. Hyde used to tell us, right? Yeah. Once you're at the table, don't act like you're not at the table. Still complain about that you're not at the table when you're at the table, right? So I think it's really just providing, mainly providing leadership opportunities, uh, organizing opportunities, because it does take work, right? Not just yeah. to give you a mic, but you, know, but you have some passion behind it and have some ability to know how to organize, learn how to organize, because young people bring a lot to the table Especially when it comes that they like to use technology for me. I'm just saying, yeah, they got a mutual benefit. So it keeps me on my toes that I got two phones. <laughs> I never, but don't call me on the second one. I never answer. But I do have two. <laughs> you need an iPhone. Like, why? But I have one. I don't use it. But, you know. The I know you want to get in my breath. I'm raising I, my hand like I'm in class so I can ask a question, Mel. The Janice has always um, asked the questions before me, and I I have the same question, uh, and you've answered them well. But I want you to talk a little bit about um, how the women um, in the movement, for lack of a better term, the women who are, are pursuing the progressive agenda have taken the forefront and to a certain discreet degree have inspired the men. Um, the women had a, a call to action week, and the brothers had a call to action day. But um, it's it appears that the men have been inspired by you, uh, the women stepping forward and asserting uh, ourselves. Uh, and that's a wonderful thing, right? And so, brothers, keep keep on keeping on. And see, for us, when we said black women and allies, we meant the brothers too. Um, but it also is good to see the brothers have their own own uh, organizing because it takes all of it, right? But yeah. it, I think what's different. Uh, and, and, and I, I never say wasn't done before, but in, it's, what's different is for black women, um, especially those who come behind, who are, who are coming generations behind ours, is that they're not, they're not as, um, what's the word I want to look, help me, Janice. Um, reticent. They're not going to take the back seat to anybody. No, they're not. They're not going to do all the work else. and let somebody else do all the time. They're not doing it. They're not going to do that. And in a way, that's and I'm not doing it. I, I've been stopped doing that. Right? So <laughs> like, if I'm working hard and, and then getting no sleep. Well, one of the things I can do is like, like, in a way, it's like, like a challenge. But it wasn't just started with us. I mean, you know, it was different times. Uh, gender roles were different. It's, it's a different time. And so for me, I'm like, we use all our, we tell other people, use all the tools in your toolbox. But guess what? Black women's role when it comes to, uh, political power for black people, we had, we, we had, and it was our duty to maximize that by stepping into our power and demanding that we're not just a voting block, but we are leaders and that we uh and that we're going to you're going to respect us in that space and it and look we haven't won that battle okay so we're better it's a better situation but i can tell you sitting as long as i've been sitting it's still a, we got a long way to go so i encourage the sisters coming for the who will take take well, not, not necessarily take a baton i don't know what that means but who will run with their baton and keep the movement going beyond when I'm want to go sit on the porch somewhere, right? Um, would take this to the next level. Um, so that we look because we stepped into it, we know doggone well. And I'm not being partisan, just factual. That's why we got a black woman vice president. That's exactly why. Because we were bold enough to demand it. And we and that's have because we knew what our numbers meant to that particular party. To have a shot at winning the White House, so what and just organizing and so you know, y'all just going out here and make it rain? No, we want something for it. 
you won't get across the finish line without it. That's the boldness we have to have with everything. And that's why yesterday you heard a theme that was was consistent. We help put you in, we can put you out. Well, that's what comes with exercising the right to vote. It all go back goes back to what you were talking about earlier. It is about the vote, our right to vote and protecting it. When our right to vote is protected and we use it, and we used it as black women, mm-hmm. uh, we can request things. I was getting ready to say demand, but we can yeah. request things, and our requests are heard. Uh, I have said so many times, um, your vote doesn't matter if you don't vote. Um, and you don't matter if you don't vote, not in the political arena. Yeah, and so matter. that's the uh, the power that we come in with as black women. Um, you're a poster child for um, being a leader in the area of voting rights and uh, civic participation. That's been your life and your role. But um, I think you're also a poster child for bringing women together, particularly black women, and busting the myth that black women can't work together, that we have too much jealousy and infighting and factions for us to work together. Speak to that a little bit. Um, I folks, you know, it's not just a women's thing. Sometimes it's difficult, just people, right? They make it just label it black women, you know, like we angry, we just that and the other. And I just dismiss it. It's hard to get people to come together, right? Um, and, but I think what's important is, and I'll talk, talk this from my years in Atlanta and talk, you know, from Dr. Height, as we all were, is that if you, Everybody got something to bring to the table. I assume if you're at the table, you know, you ready to do, you know, we're we, we going to figure this out. I don't like the idea of it has to be an elite group over here and everybody else follow us. Because I wasn't, I just wasn't raised that way in the movement. I wasn't trained that way um, um, in my years here in D.C., although sometimes that's counterculture here. Yeah, because right. there is a sort of a pecking yeah. order. Um, and, um, and so, I mean, I, I'll tell this. Melvin yeah. was instrumental. There's a group of legacy civil rights organizations that meet. And it's not a closed group, but it's kind of a closed group. Kind of, you got to get invited to the group. Melanie was one of the few organizations representing primarily women at that table. She used her power within that group to get NCNW invited to that table. Or uh, back at the table that you were already at. Or back at the table. But used to be at. Used to be at. To get us reintroduced mm-hmm. where, where Dr. Height is no longer there. And so I'm grateful for that. But now you're talking about bold events. I have not seen anything. And there's going to be a movie about this. And I <laughs> just kind of like to talk about it. But there's going to be a movie about how we got a black woman vice president. And it's going to have a lot to do with boldness and Melanie Campbell's boldness talking straight to Joe Biden in his face. And what it reminded me of was the same way, and I know Jim Clyburn did have a lot to do with Mm -hmm. with Biden and all that. But I'm telling you what else happened. Black women in South Carolina said we want somebody who can beat Donald Trump, and then we'll figure out the rest of it later. And that was what re- – now, Jim Clyburn is a smart politician. He ran yes. against black women, and he, he made the announcement and talked about his poor wife, and we all cried with him. But the fact of the matter was – The fact of the matter was that was five or six days before the election. And being here in South Carolina, you know I love and respect greatly – Oh, uh, Jim Clyburn, he's not my elected congressman, but he's my congressman because he's the only black one from South Carolina. Uh, we had already made that decision. We had already looked at Joe Biden and looked at how he was able to um, follow Barack Obama for eight years. That meant something to us as uh, women here in South Carolina to take a secondary role. It was the only role he could take. Uh, He would be a a senator if he didn't take that role. But to have a secondary role and to exercise it gracefully um, under the leadership of Barack Obama meant something to us. And also it meant something that he was an older white man. And the black women perceived in South Carolina that he would be the kind of person 
that white people could vote for. And that's just the truth. And we made that decision very early on. It wasn't a coincidence that all 46 counties in South Carolina went for Joe Biden. It was because of black women. Um, and, and I can say it because I'm one of them here in South Carolina. I mm-hmm. appreciate Congressman Clyburn, uh, coming out a few days before the election and endorsing Joe Biden. We, we deeply appreciate it because his connections run so deep in this state and the respect level is so high that it means something. But I'm going to tell you, we made that decision be, uh, before that announcement. Well, I, was, I was in South Carolina that breakfast that was held that morning and I watched the black women, me and Clayola Brown, who's from, as y'all know, from South Carolina, was sitting together and I think Roland Martin was in there was in, in the, Others, but and Reverend Sharpton them hosted that that breakfast. You saw women sitting there, and I watched them with their hands folded as people spoke. And then I watched how they looked when when Biden spoke. I said, "Well, me and Clay was like, mm, this done." But I know you all. Uh, I've, got, I've got to run. Okay, love y'all. Melanie, Thank and you Melanie, guys. you know you got a home here anytime. Come back. Yeah, I'll, I'll come back. We got we got a debrief about yesterday. Yes, okay. ma'am. Thank you, Thank you so much. Love you. Love you. Love you too. Hi again, it's Rosie D along with Michael Forsyth, and you're listening to WQATLB FM 99.5. We are the radio station of Allen Temple AME Church, the downtown church here in Greenville, South Carolina. Again, I want to thank Melanie Campbell and the sisters in law. We truly thank you for being on today's segment, and I truly appreciate you, Melanie, for being there for all of us women and speaking out. We need more people like you, and again, I just want to wish you the best of success. So, um, Michael, we're going to have a little discussion about Melanie because I, I was taking some notes as I was listening to them, um, talking down, and she she said some really great things that I think we need to probably discuss about. One of the things that she said was... Um, She's striving to protect our voting rights. Um, I understand, you know, we, we all have voting rights. Why why do you think that they're trying to, to change the voting rights? Do you think it is more about power and control over people? Or what is it? Are we trying to go to an authoritative uh, leadership? What do you think about this? Well, you know, they never really wanted us to have the vote mm. to begin with. And I think it's just a return to their old ways and... You know, they have are very clear, very direct in what they're trying to do, which is prevent black people from voting. They think that they'll be able to shape society and the laws and the taxes and whatever the best in the way they want if they, in a very, you know, very brutal manner, I would have to say, um, make it impossible for us to vote. This is crazy. So why not be inclusive if you want to? change these laws just be fair to these people that you don't want to be a part of that and in that way you know if everything was fair and and level like everyone should be on the same level anyway we wouldn't have to worry about others taking over or different segments of the population taking over who thinks about this stuff well it's a very interesting change of direction in the republican party because you know if you look back at the 1960 election between um Richard Nixon and JFK, Mm -hmm. um, the Republican Party was very competitive when it came to civil rights. They were making a pitch for the black voters as well. Um, And so that was the idea, as you would with every other group, farmers, you know, uh, you know, uh, pot airplane pirates, you would try and figure out, well, if I want their vote, what can I what can I do for them? What can right. I offer them? Promise them. But now the idea is, well, instead of doing that, no, what we're going to do is we're going to suppress suppress those votes. And and I'm not sure how successful that will be because you you can only you know there you can we can if we register enough we can always out we can, as many people as they strip from the voting rolls we can um, we can. Uh, bring in more voters. Mm-hmm. Well, you know what, Michael? I heard something really disturbing the other day. Um, someone said, 
I'm not going to even vote anymore because my vote doesn't count. That's just, I'm like, oh, my eyes got really big. I'm like, really? You know, some people feel that, especially people of color, some people of color feel that, why even vote? Because it doesn't matter. It doesn't count. Uh, are they going to throw it out like they tried to do, you know, in the last few elections? I, I just find this really disturbing. And, you know, I don't, I don't know what people are thinking. Or, you know, why, what would, what would, what would you think that would cause people to think this way because of these things that are happening or what? What do you, how do you feel about that when you hear people say, I'm not going to vote because my vote doesn't count? It, it does count. Well, you know, first of all, in the, even in large national elections, we've seen things come to very narrow margins mm -hmm. in, um, in certain states. But in addition to that, we have to remember that in addition to the presidential election, there are local elections, there right. are city council elections. We're most definitely, you know, where, where seven people, hundred people come out to vote. Well, your vote most definitely makes a difference. And we're, we're going to have, uh, coming up in a, in a show uh, before Election Day, we're going to have uh, an interview with um, Russell Stahl, mm -hmm. who is um, currently a councilman at large in Greenville. Right. And now he's running for re-election. And, you know, 2021, people aren't focusing on these elections, but they're very important sometimes who's on the city council of your right. city or the county council that has more of a direct impact exactly on life. i think it's even more important when we vote in the local elections because these are the people who go you know they eventually go on to uh bigger leadership roles like if you're on the school board and uh, hey i'm successful at this then maybe i might run for governor and then hey i'm doing this well and let me go to you know, the yes. capital. So it is very important that we vote in local elections. But when I hear people say, I'm not voting because, you know, this, that, or the third, I, that just bothers me. And even when you try to convince them, it's like the same way it is trying to convince someone to get a COVID shot when they yes. don't want to get one. So, And, you know, the thing of it is, you know, if you look at the history of this state, South Carolina, mm -hmm. and throughout the South, what sacrifices people made Exactly. In order to get you that a right to vote, right. you know, you should be ashamed in um, disrespecting our ancestors. You should be so running much. to the polls. I yes, mean, because if it weren't for them, you wouldn't be sitting in your house drinking your tea or whatever. You wouldn't be doing all of this, and then you you have a nerve to say, "I'm not going to vote because this, that, and the third. My vote doesn't count. It does count. And even if it didn't count, Michael, I still would vote." You yeah, know? and I got to tell you that. Um, the um, older conservative white people in this community and throughout America, mm -hmm. they make sure they go out and vote. Oh, yeah. They don't, you know, they may not be following the news. They may not know the facts or really have a good right. understanding of what's going on. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily consider being educated about issues part of their civic responsibility, but they definitely see voting as their civic responsibility. It is, and a they're civic doing duty. it. It Absolutely. is a civic duty. You're it's right. a civic duty. It's your. You have to go do this. This is something that it should be mandatory. If you if you don't vote, then something should be stripped from you. You know. Well, if you don't vote, something will be stripped. Well, from you. <laughs> exactly. It's a self-correcting problem. Exactly right. Okay, so. Um, yeah, we, we, I just think, you know, Melanie Campbell and the sisters-in-law, we truly thank you for being on our t on today's segment. And as always, um, you know, the sisters-in-law, they, they always have a dynamic platform whenever they're talking to anyone. All right. Any other things on voting rights? Oh, I had another thing I wanted to talk about, Michael, in that too. Let me, before we close that out. Um, she was talking about voter, voting, voters' rights and the constitutional rights which pertain to a woman's right to choose about her reproductive concerns. You know, a lot of people, I don't know, they're just, a lot of women, you know, sometimes I see women, we're divided, you know, black women, white women, when we all should be working together because even if you're a white woman, you're still going to be discriminated against if you lose your rights, you know? Mm. So um, I, I found that very interesting. She brought that up too, and I really appreciate her when she goes out and talks mm. about these issues on behalf of women because I don't want to lose any rights in America yeah. because you lose a right, you lose other things. Yeah. All right.
and the power of the vote can be used either to hurt you or help you. That was a, a good statement there, yes, too. So yes. by all means, if you're out there, women, vote, 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 vote. It is your civic duty to vote. All right. So we're going to move on again. I'm Rosie D. Please stay tuned for more music and some final commentary here on WQAT. Hi again, it's Rozzy D along with Michael Forsyth. And again, you're listening to WQAT LP FM 99.5, the radio station of Allen Temple AME Church in downtown Greenville, South Carolina. Today's commentary, I'm, I'm bouncing off of a wonderful Bible app plan written by a pastor by the name of Craig Groschel, where he talks about how our lives are always moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. Do you know that what we think shapes who we are? And this is no exaggeration because our lives follow the direction of our thinking. So the best we grasp that truth, the better equipped we will be to change the traje trajectory of our lives. Not only does science speak the truth about trajectory, but so does the Bible. The Bible speaks to us in Philippians 4 and 8 through 9, where the apostle Paul writes, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. In those three sentences, Paul, he, he talks about three, three things. He moves from thought, think about such things, to action, where he said, put it into praxis, and then he said to experience, the God of peace will be with you. Paul is telling us that our thoughts truly shape our lives. For example, in modern psychology, cognitive behavioral therapy teaches or reveals that many problems from eating disorders to relational challenges, addictions, and even some forms of depression and anxiety are rooted in faulty and negative patterns of thinking. And treating these problems begin with changing your, the way you think. So in order for things to change in your life, you have to change the way you think. The science of cognitive behavioral therapy demonstrates that what God spoke to us through Solomon over 3,000 years ago still rings true today. Solomon says in Proverbs, 23 and 7 um, for as he thinks his heart in his heart so is he that's as he thinks in his heart so is he and that's Proverbs 23 23 and 7 therefore if the Bible and modern psychology is aligning and is teaching us that our lives will move in direction of our strongest thoughts then we should be asking ourselves do I like the trajectory or direction my thoughts are taking me if your answer is no then it is highly probable that it's time to decide to change your way of thinking so that God can change your life. I'm a living witness of that because it's hard to change bad habits. And I say this because I'm currently struggling with my own personal challenges in changing the way I think about eating and controlling my weight and just overall good health. In my case, it's all about reprogramming my thoughts in order to control my weight and stay healthy. However, for you out there listening and have a train wreck of thoughts going on, that may be holding you back, please realize that when you discipline yourself and team up with God, that your thinking will be transformed exponentially. Uh, with God's help, you can transform your mind. You can stop believing the lies that hold you back. You can end the vicious th cycle of thoughts that are destructive to you and others. You can allow God to renew your mind by saturating you with his unchanging truth. So therefore, the principle of this message is Reframe your mind and your thinking so you can restore your perspective. And if you would like to learn more about winning the war in your mind by Pastor Greg Groschel, you can go to the Bible app and download the plan titled Winning the War in Your Mind or visit the website CraigGroschel.com and that's C-R-A-I-G-G-R-O-E-S-C-H-E-L.com. Well, we are at the end of our segment today, and I want to say a few final things before we go. I want to thank Mark Allen Gunnels and Melanie Campbell for being a part of our show today. We truly appreciate you all for being on the show. And Michael, before I go close out, what do you think about that? That 
um, commentary I had today. I mean, I, I really like this guy. He yes, he's really powerful. That, that thing about your thoughts determining um, everything. You know, you've heard that thing of is the glass half empty or mm, half full? Exactly. And it, it really uh, the the your reality, the world that you're in, are you in a happy state or a negative one? Right. It's it's based on how you see things. Exactly. Right. So you just have to reprogram your mind or just think about it. It's even like. Learning to pray, you know, before, it used to be kind of like half, you know, I'll say my grace and say a prayer at mm -hmm. night. But, you know, now when things go through my mind and I'm thinking, okay, let me just reprogram and I pray and it meditates me. I meditate off of that and it just kind of calms me, you know. Mm -hmm. So I just reprogram myself, whatever's going on in my life, just pray about it. And then, you know, clear your thoughts and then you get a better direction. So I really like that one and I wanted to share that today. And finally, if you are listening to us and are not a part of Allen Temple AME Church and you would like to join or visit us, please go to our website at allentempleamechurch.org for more information and on how to be a part of our Sunday sermon via virtual broadcast. You can catch us on Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. And we also have virtual Bible study every Wednesday at noon and 6.30 p.m. Check the church website or check email bulletins if you're subscribed to our emails. And as always, you are welcome to physically visit us at 109 Green Avenue here in Greenville, South Carolina. Michael, anything else before we close out today? No, a, another great show. And uh, we Absolutely. have some more interesting things coming yes. up as we get close to Halloween. Some other yes, yes, surprises. Yes. yes. Okay. Well, again, I'm Rozzy D along with Michael Forsythe. I'm so happy that I could be a service through this broadcast. And until next time. Stay healthy, stay encouraged, and have a blessed week.
Cause you're all I need This ain't love that's glad to see But darling, stay with me Oh, won't you stay with me Cause you're Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's just take it back a little bit. One, two, three, say. You might as well go on ahead and get your dance on. Jesus, be a man. Yeah. 